for just three or four more minutes and we'll start. I can share with you that the way we structured it is we'll present the Ghana case first for about 20 minutes and discussions, then the Pakistan case and then discussions. So I'll just maybe wait for a couple of more minutes for people to also come in and I'll have an update from Sutia. And uh, then I can start.
Welcome everyone, thank you very much for joining us and I'm sorry about the delay. Let me, without further ado, uh, request our discussant, Dr. Sufia Siddiqui, to join us on stage and also the, Dr. Michael Bokudo. Um, or you could invite him, actually. Yeah, and for you, no. I'll come later. There's nothing else. Yeah. Uh, which mic do you want me to use? Oh, so they wanted you to use this one okay. for better quality. Sound quality. How can you do that? Thank you. Uh, does, yeah? Does yeah. Work? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, hey, hey everyone, it's like home. Thank you for joining us today, and sorry about the delay. Uh, there seems to be something very special happening on campus, mm -hmm. a very long line outside the gate. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, exactly. <laughs> um, so um, what I'll do is, I think we were supposed to have body stop today. Unfortunately, he's not feeling well, uh, so he's away. Um, what I'll do is try to introduce what we're going to be talking about today. And I will also introduce both of our panelists. And uh, I think most people here know me. And if they don't, we'll find out eventually who I am when I question you guys. <laughs> um, so today's talk is, uh, well, really it's about understanding delivery approach both in the Ghana and the Pakistani context. And this is part of, Rabia, if I'm not wrong, a wider um, kind of multi-country case study, which is looking at how a particular thought process is being used to accelerate education service delivery, uh, especially in contexts like ours, which have had a turbulent history and are typically classified as low-income uh, country contexts. And so is there a way to move the needle on delivery and outcomes for education is really what this project is being driven by. Um, so, you know, I've been given a prompt to read, but I am not in habit of reading from notes. <laughs> so I'm trying to, I'm going to try and summarize. Uh, you know, I think really where this conversation is coming from is that governments uh, uh, have, have tried many things, and it's a little bit about, okay, what's going to stick, but typically have not generated enough evidence about what works. And also, uh, equally importantly, what does not work so that we don't keep trying it over and over. Um, in 2019, the Global Partnership for Education uh, concluded that uh, about a third of education sector plans, and Pakistan has a rich history uh, in those as well, um, they, sh you know, they should not be rated as not, should be, what should be rated as not achievable uh, due to financial constraints and implementation challenges. Uh, which is to say what? That often we design things in one place, and then when we put them into practice, the reason that they don't translate down to ground level outcomes is because of unanticipated uh, obstacles along the way. Um, and that's really where the delivery approach was coming from. And one example was, uh, and I think this was what's called you know, the classic example where it started from, the Prime Minister's delivery unit in the UK, um, which was a big one, which was touted for having really accelerated the way things were happening in the UK in the public um, sector. Um, there's also one called Big Results, in Ten big, big Results Now in Tanzania. And uh, the one that is probably most familiar to all of you is the Chief Minister's Special Monitoring Unit, which was based in the Punjab here in Pakistan. 
Um, and then we have one in Pamandu in Malaysia and uh, the experiment around learning pacts in Brazil in Pernambuco, am I pronouncing it correctly, Pernambuco State in Brazil? Um, so those are some examples of different initiatives that have been attempted. And today we'll hear about the Punjab case from Rabia, uh, and we'll hear about the Ghana case uh, from uh, Michael. So I'm going to move into the introduction. Michael, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you a little bit, and then I will allow you to add to that introduction as you open up into your work. Um, so Dr. Michael Bokidam is Director General for the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration at University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Um, uh, Michael got his PhD in higher education leadership from Ohio University uh, in the US and uh, a Master of Educational Administration and his Bachelor of Education uh, degrees, both of them from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Um, you know, the other day we were hearing a lot about this university and how it's really kind of been trying to make an impact in the education space in Ghana. It's fascinating. Um, hopefully you guys can, you know, maybe take the opportunity during Q&A to ask not just about the project, but also how the university's environment has helped facilitate this kind of investigative research into education service delivery. Uh, Michael's research interests include inter international and contemporary issues in higher education and student affairs, as well as diversity and inclusion in education. Uh, educational experiences of underrepresented populations and school improvement. Uh, Dr. Bokyodom is passionate about cultivating culturally indigenous knowledge in education. And in June 2022, the president of the Republic of Ghana appointed him as the national convener for the Transforming Education Summit held at the United Nations headquarters in New York City from the 16th to the 20th of September um, last year. Uh, prior to joining the IEPA faculty, he served as Dean of Students at Hiwasi College in Madis Madisonville, Tennessee, uh, Residential Coordinator at Ohio University, and Senior Staff Member at the University of Cape Coast. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for coming all the way, especially at a time when people are probably telling you, why are you going to Pakistan? <laughs> so we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Um, should I introduce, Rabbi, should I go right now, or do you want to be introduced when oh, you come to talk? Fine. Is that mic working well? I think so. Hello. Okay, great. All right, so uh, thank you very much. I will prefer to stand um, and, and, and take care of my presentation. But I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's been great since we arrived. Um, I came with my colleague, uh, Reverend Father Raymond uh, Father Ray. We arrived on Monday afternoon. And uh, we started work right away. Tuesday was great. Uh, today has been fantastic. Uh, and I believe tomorrow morning will also be another uh, great final session. We are returning uh, tomorrow, but I assure you that we'll be back. <laughs> We've had fun, so we'll definitely be back. So um, as Sophia indicated, I want to make sure I position myself well. So, Mike, maybe this will work for you. Yes. Okay. So, this is yours. All right. And uh, my microphone, let me put this one down. Okay. All right. So, as we hear from the introduction, many governments. Many ministries of education um, have gone through different stages of delivery approaches, management practices in an attempt to transform education, and especially in an attempt to achieve the expected student learning outcomes. In all that we do, we want to see the impact reflect in student learning outcomes. So Ghana is not different. Ghana have done this since independence, have gone through many, many curricular reviews, have gone through many educational reforms. Um, our education sector plan, five year after five year um, targets, make some targets, and <clears throat> we still struggle to achieve the expected outcomes. So the, as I said, ESP has been there. Um, the current one is 
from 2018 to 2025. Um, the Ghana Accountability for Learning Outcomes, the Gallup project has also been there with some specific targets, um, with funding from the World Bank. And then delivery approach came in. Um, in 2017, we had a new minister, new government after the 2026, uh, 2016, sorry, after the 2016 elections. So 2017, new government, new minister of education with specific goal to transform education in Ghana. So the government of Ghana and the Ministry of Education adopted the, deliver, the, the deliver ed delivery approach. Um, as, as a means to transform education in Ghana. Now, the intended theory of change was that the mandating delivery approach would drive implementation of the ESP and the Gallup and ultimately improve final learning outcomes, including teaching practices and student learning, um, learning outcomes. So this was how we began with the current delivery approach that we have adopted. So at a national level, the government of Ghana, again, through the Ministry of Education, established the National Reform Secretariat, a national secretariat to oversee the implementation of this particular delivery approach. So it started at a national level. An office was created at the Ministry of Education. Uh, staff were recruited, headed by a former acting chief director of the ministry, very experienced man, to lead this process. So at a national level, a lot of things were done. The first thing that was done was to try to realign the various agencies within the ministry. Uh, so the Ministry of Education has 21 agencies, each working separately and not seeing much alignment. So the first thing that they decided to do was to try to realign all these agencies with a particular focus. Now, when that happened, then the minister indicated that one, um, once every month, every agency within the ministry will account to the minister. So he introduced the accounting to the minister initiative. So directors with specific targets, with specific uh, KPIs will on a monthly basis account to the minister. Yeah. Then initially people were complaining that is this unit a police service to monitor and watch what we do and look for forms to victimize us. So people were suspicious of the work of the reform secretariat. But few months into the process, they started seeing some results. They started understanding the work of the reform secretariat. So instead of seeing the secretariat as a witch hunting um, office, they started talking about the fact that, oh, this is helpful. Uh, they are providing key feedback. They are giving us some direction. They've given us specific targets that we have seen some level of achievement. So we moved to the subnational level. So at the national level, things were being done, a lot of busy things, busy schedules, targets, issues of accountability, all these things were being discussed at the national level. Now at the district level, the expectation was for whatever was happening at the national level to gradually translate into the regional and the district offices. So some attempts were made uh, to have regional directors of education, district directors of education to sign performance contracts, just as has been done at the national level. So these started happening. So what a team comprising um, colleagues from University of Oxford, University of Toronto, and IEPA, University of Cape Coast did was one, to use qualitative approach method to find out what has been happening at a national level. So the secretariat was established in 2017, and in 2021, 2022, we went back there <coughs> to find out what had been done and the successes that have been achieved. And this was supported by Education Commission uh, with some funding, and then FCDO uh, also supported in that direction. So we did purely interviews at the national level. Then we moved to the district level, the sub-national, the regional and the district offices, and also this qualitative uh, study, interviewing district directors, interviewing uh, regional directors, interviewing school heads, uh, to find out whether the delivery approach that had been mandated 
we're achieving the results. So our goal basically was to find out whether um, the intended outcomes were being met. Now, in, in addition to the uh, qualitative aspect, we also did a large-scale quantitative study of management practices and performances. But for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus on the qualitative component of the work that we did. So you see the time frame uh, when the various specific activities uh, were done. So some results from the work that we did after four or five years of work of these various delivery approaches. Emphasis on accountability, target setting, and then improvement. So these were the key indicators that we went out with to find out whether targets were being met, uh, whether accountability tools were being upheld, and then whether we're seeing real improvement as expected. Now, at the national level, um, the Ministry of Education, Ghana Education Service Agencies, and I've talked about this already, started the realignment, intentional realignment, to make sure that um, things were done properly, to make sure that they were all working towards one ultimate goal of improving the standard of education uh, in Ghana. At the sub-national level, as part of this approach, uh, decentralization was being promoted, that districts and regional offices should be able to work by themselves without much directions from the national level. The goal was to empower the regional offices and the district offices to be able to work independently to a large extent. The practice had been basic functions of the region and the district being dictated from the national office. So for instance, uh, simple exercises like transfer of staff, moving, moving one staff from a school A to school B in a particular district was being done by a national office from the headquarters. So the delivery approach was to make sure that we empower the subnational actors to be able to make some decisions at their level. I know my school very well. I know my district very well. I know where there are vacancies. Why should the person come from Accra or from the national office? So emphasis was put on decentralizing uh, basic education uh, provision. And then mixed success of past donor supported, I've also talked about this, a lot of funded interventions have been uh, undertaken, and we're still not seeing the results that we expected. Uh, a lot of changes in terms of management <coughs> practices have been done, we're still not seeing the results that we expected. So National uh, Reform Secretariat, I've mentioned that was established, and then uh, they were looking at routines, annual cycle roadmap, identification of Reform Secretariat, setting of KPIs, and then signing of performance agree agreements. So at a national level, uh, every director signed a national um, a performance contract to deliver on sp some specific targets. Same was done at the regional and the district offices. And then we had technical working groups, uh, quarterly accounting to the minister, made an enter performance report and assessment by independent consultants. So quarterly, um, one will have to account to make sure that the performance contract that you signed, you were meeting your targets. And then to also ensure that we're also seeing real life improvements. So over time, we realized that emphasis shifted from performance management and accountability to appreciation, to appreciation for the role delivery approaches play in enhancing collaboration and coordination. So as I indicated, the national office is closer to the seat of the Minister of Education. The expectation is that the minister is watching, the directors are watching, so issues of accountability were very strong at the national level. Because you are close uh, to the seat of government, and you may be in your office, the minister can pop in to find out what is going on. So at the national level, more emphasis on accountability. Accountability measures were great. People were really accounting for what has been given to them to deliver. So that was good. So a quote from uh, the Minister of Education at the time, I made them understand that going forward, I'm not going to wait on monitoring evaluation reports. I'm going to ensure that accountability is done in real time, attached to human beings with names and telephone numbers, and report on projects and programs they are undertaking. So everybody working with me knew the game had changed. So this was a quote that we got from the minister 
uh, during the interview. So he set the standards very high. And he was watching, making following up, not waiting for <coughs> annual MAU reports, but on daily basis, on weekly basis, he was following up to be sure what was going on and happening in real life. And then um, another quote from um, Ghana National Education Agency head. It felt like going to defend your dissertation. I would say that in the beginning, it was a bit more didactic. You know, you go in and then you deliver on your key performance indicators. It was a bit more rigid in how we began. But I think it was also because there was a learning curve to understand these meetings. Over the course of 2018, 2019, and even into 2020, we have seen the activity more as an opportunity for us to support our other colleagues and provide feedback for colleagues in other agencies and also for us to be able to identify where they are, there are areas of collaboration within the agencies. So the mindset began to change. That instead of thinking about only my agency, I'm now thinking about how we can collaborate as 21 agencies with one vision and one goal. So they had moved from working independently to collaboration and working together for a common goal. And they also realized that it wasn't about competition among individual agencies, but it was about achieving some success as a team. So the mindset definitely was shifting. Delivery approach, design, implementation, the Ghana way. So we made it a Ghana way. Delivery approach has, from Oxford and other places, have a framework. But we also made it a Ghana way, realizing that there were some existing management practices prior to these delivery approaches. And there are some traditional leadership practices that are still relevant and good that we did not throw away. So that was what we referred to as uh, the Ghana way. The establishment of the reform secretary has brought life into what my agency is doing. So while they initially perceived this secretariat as a police service, they are now realizing the relevance of this secretariat coordinating these activities. So scope and approach also evolved from narrow to wider set of uh, performance target from the six big agencies to all reform. So previously, while they were looking at smaller targets at their individual agency level, they started looking at broader targets as a team. So dreaming big, hoping to achieve big things instead of the small things that the agencies were, were aiming at uh, at their level. So reform secretary perceived by reform owners as supportive facilitators. So again, shifting from a police service, witch hunting concept to a supportive cross-agency um, secretariat. So they were now, they were realizing the support that the rich reform secretary was offering. That we are reminding ourselves to keep to your targets. Um, as, as an agency, let us look at our performance in relation to our KPIs. Let us look at our performance in relation to the target that we have set for ourselves. And then let us continuously um, evaluate ourselves to ensure that we are on track. So the secretariat and the activities of the secretariat, the delivery approach was being accepted. The level of acceptability um, was really going up. When I came to the agency, I saw reform secretary as a policeman. I've mentioned this. Let me just give the direct quote. Policing everybody. I mean putting pressure on people to do this and to do that. But at a point, I realized that it is not what they set themselves to do. But rather, they set themselves to support the agencies. And that is when I really started using the reform secretariat very well. So that, that, is, that is a shift uh, from negative perception to a very positive perception. And the changes to internal management routines reported by some national agencies. So reporting style changed. The content of the report changed. Um, reports were not only talking about lack of this and lack of this. We don't have this. That is why we couldn't do this. Two, we didn't have this. But we've been able to do A, B, and C through our own generation of some resources internally through innovations. Because sometimes we tend to complain that we don't have resources and we won't do anything. But again, that mindset also started changing. That even if my budget allocation has not been released and there's no money, I know that the six-year-old boy 
and the six-year-old girl in class one must go to class two the following year. So even if I don't get funding the entire year, what can I do locally at my own level to ensure that I improvise, I get some local resources to be able to support, to be able to support uh, them. And then evolution of the delivery approach. So in 2021, the minister set up all this. I think I've talked about this already. So let's go to the sub-national district and then the, uh, the, the, the district at the regional level. Again, I've talked about the methodology already. Uh, we went to three regions out of the 16 regions in Ghana, five districts and 10 schools within the regional offices and the district offices. So what did we find? Design of sub-national delivery approach differed from national model. So what was practiced at the national level was a little bit different from what was practiced at the district and the regional level. First year focus on performance contrast, less on accountability. So while at the national level, there was so much focus on accountability, at the district level, the focus was on performance contracts. And then problem solving. Because at the school level, you see the real problems. Classrooms without chairs, what do you do? District assembly supporting these schools to provide furniture for schools. So the focus was not accountability. Because we had realized from the regional level, national level that when you focus more on accountability, people get scared and don't even do their work. People pretend to be doing their work to please the minister and the supervisors and not really doing their work. So we moved away from the word accountability to Let's sign a contract, and then let's solve the problems. Overall, implementation of delivery approach cascade, vary, cascade varied across the streets and schools. So within the, the five districts that we went to, there were differences. There were some districts that were doing well with accountability, and these were two districts closer to Accra, the national offices. Because again, you have officers from a national office visiting these offices. So they were emulating um, what was happening at the national level, they were also focused on accountability. But in other districts away from the regional capital, there was so much focus on um, um, problem solving and then uh, setting of targets. I won't go into this. So if effective, evidence of effective implementation, some districts demonstrated strong consistency. So some districts demonstrated the capacity to really achieve the results more than the others. While some districts are more resourceful, some districts have uh, more experienced staff. So we saw these differences between among the districts. It wasn't the same. Uh, clear expectations. Almost all officers knew what their superiors and stakeholders expect them to do. So that was clear. Everybody knew the expectation. They could show you evidence. This is my schedule for the week. I'm expected to do A, B, and C. And this was across all the districts. Uh, problem solving and collaboration to address implementation challenges. They had clear plan of how to resolve and fix some of their challenges within the districts. Performance contrast shape priorities and activities. In some regional and district offices, evidence of increased district and school monitoring. So monitoring got better at the regional and district offices. Um, targets were clearer, and they knew exactly how to do this. And then, again, I've said this already too, um, evidence of less implementation. So depend on the district and the school that you are in, you either see um, evidence of more effective implementation or evidence of less effective implementation. They were not, they were not the same. Challenges in implementing performance contracts at sub-national level. Some struggled, want to even understand what the performance contract meant, um, while others knew what it was and they were delivering, an indication that the districts are not the same and the schools are also not the same. And we also indicated that it is too early to say how accountability mechanisms were working in the districts. Um, and the reason was that the accountability measure was less focused within the districts. And within the period that we were on the field, we realized that uh, we didn't have enough data to really say how accountability mechanisms were working uh, in the districts. But they were working very well at the national level, and the evidence uh, showed that. So finally, um, effectiveness of accountability versus problem solving oriented delivery approach. So which of the two would you want to focus on? And I think it's for um, 
policymakers, you know, to think about whether to focus more on accountability or to focus more on problem solving. And the challenges in the subnational delivery of education reforms, uh, alignment and communication, political sponsorship, and also resource, these are challenges were clear. Sometimes even fuel to, for an inspector to travel from the office to the school wouldn't be there. There were instances where individuals would donate some money uh, for them to be able to buy fuel to do that. So these are real challenges uh, that we saw. And the sustainability of the delivery approach. As we speak, in the Ghana situation, the um, National Reform Secretariat mandate ends in March. So after March, they are not sure what is going to happen. There are attempts to absorb them into the Ministry of Education, but the staff at the Reform Secretariat supervising this are not too excited about joining the Ministry of Education staff because their salary will be lower than what they are getting now based on their contracts. So um, again, sustainability is not clear, and uh, we're hoping that between now and March, we'll be able to figure something out to be sure how to continue with this approach. It's been helpful. We've seen it, um, the results are clear, and uh, we would strongly recommend that some attempts are made to, to sustain it. Um, I think these rec policy recommendations have been said already. Continue the emphasis on collaboration, capacity building, and problem solving functions for the National Reform Secretariat. And then at the district level, harmonize grant education service performance contract with existing processes such as ADIOP. The ADIOP is the annual district education operational plans. Uh, these are existing documents that we believe we can throw away. We must find a way to uh, harmonize existing uh, documents like this uh, with what we are doing. And then support and monitor, especially making sure district staff know how to use performance contracts. Leverage emerging research to understand how to best cascade accountability and problem solving functions from the national level. So what I will say finally is that the delivery approach is working well in Ghana. It seems to be working better at the national level because of more resources because of closeness to the head office and because of the way it is, they are being monitored. At the district level, uh, it's not working as well as we find in the national level, but even within the districts, there are some districts that are doing better than others. But the big challenge is availability of resources and our ability to sustain this initiative. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. I just uh, I was wondering whether we want to keep the slides up so that if we wanted to refer to something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah let me just. Yeah. Okay. Slides, uh, share so, guys, what we're going to yeah. do is I'm going to talk about it for a little bit, yeah, then we'll bring Rabia in, and then we'll open it up for all of you to raise some questions. Yeah, so now's a good time to kind of write those questions down, pay attention, listen to what we're saying, and say, no, they both have it wrong. I know how to fix this. <laughs> um, Mike, I had a couple of questions. You know, as I went through your slides, really interesting. Oh, I mean, uh, I'm already seeing differences between what we know about the Pakistan case, and we'll know more uh, once Rabia talks to us about it, um, in comparison with the Ghana context. And, one thing I was interested to know was like, what was the experience like working um, through COVID? Because uh, you did have field work during COVID, right? And uh, so, the, so the agencies would also have that comparative perspective. They started the programming before the pandemic and then presumably had to transition into digital realms. Was that the case? So the pilots um, happened at the tail end of COVID. So when COVID was um, almost leaving us to have our peace, okay. we did a pilot at the national level. So that wasn't too much of a problem okay. because it was at a very small scale. Now in 2021, okay. when we went out for the sub-national data collection, yeah. uh, COVID was, um, the restrictions had been eased in Ghana um, and wearing of masks was optional and all that kind of stuff. So it, it didn't pose a problem. Okay. Um, when we were collecting data for the sub-national uh, level at the regional district and school levels, even though we we're cautious of the fact that COVID had not completely 
uh, gone. Uh, but to directly answer your question, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big problem uh, for okay. us at the data, on the field. But was it a problem at the delivery end in uh, terms of, you know, I mean, I, I imagine there must have been a lot of in-person engagement required to really bring people on board, have them like kind of participate in a paradigm shift. You, you have evidence saying the game has changed, right? That's a big statement from a political kind of sponsor. Um, any ideas around how they grappled with those disruptions when this was already very young? So um, many people, and I think it's not only Ghana, many people sometimes are suspicious of initiatives from the politicians. Mm -hmm. And especially when in our case, government had changed from one political party to the other. So even at the ministry, uh, there were suspicions as to whether the minister is going to keep the staff, or change the staff, or keep the staff, or bring a party member to this position and all that. So when the minister and the ministry started this, the initial perception we learned was that he is looking for reason to sack A and B and replace them with this even though the intent was really to bring efficiency into the system, they were suspicious. So that was the basis for the initial resistance. But months into the process, they realized that, oh, no, that isn't the intent. The intent really is to ensure that we are more focused, we are more targeted, we are monitoring um, our tax, and we are achieving results. So then the mindset changed. So it moved from initial suspicion of an initiative with a very positive intent to a politician looking for reason to witch hunt and victimize people. So when they realized that, no, completely different from what we, we thought, uh, then it started settling. People started accepting it well at a national level, and it has become very successful. And does that kind of... Um you know, that space of a little bit of political economy and trust is a very important variable which is often investigated these days, especially in research into the bureaucracy. Um, did it also feature in the effectiveness of moving the system from accountability towards mentorship, which is kind of the sense I'm getting from many of your slides, where you're saying that you were able to kind of cross that threshold of we're not here to police you, we're here to help you. So again, similar reason. Again, at the regional and district offices were directors appointed by the previous regime. You know, so that suspicion at the national level also was evident at the regional and the district offices. But again, similar to the situation at the national level, when the cascading started and the regional directors and their staff started seeing results of the various um, um, interventions. So, for instance, every regional director had signed a performance contract with the with the minister, uh, with the director general of general education service. Uh, they were regular monitoring, not finding faults. Right. The monitors will go and engage. What have you done? What is the evidence? Um, how do we make sure it gets better? So, when they were getting this feedback and these exchanges from the national offices, it became clear to them that they are not after us. Uh, again, they are providing feedback to help improve performance. Uh, so yes, political economy, some element of suspicion uh, initially, but it changed. And, and as we speak, um, they are all on track, uh, following um, their performance contracts, uh, making sure it is executed well, uh, making sure targets are being met, uh, even though resource constraints you know, continue to pose a challenge uh, in, in some of the areas. And were, was the research that you guys were doing along the way kind of iteratively feeding back into the system? Or did you have long periods of time where you're just kind of collecting data, but the system doesn't know whether it's on track or not, other than the routines? Like, was research a factor in changing the way people thought? Um, to some extent, because we've done a couple of um, uh, user engagement uh, activities. We've gone back to the districts to share the, the final results. Uh, we've done some media engagements. We've done some at the national level, at the regional level, 
at the district level, even at the school level, in some of the schools. So the resource has really gone back to the users, and we see some of the recommendations being implemented. Um, we've seen headmasters who are performing better now as compared to last year, uh, because the issues are clearer, uh, they understand the issues better, and they have seen the results, the findings of the work that we went there to do. And the user engagements are ongoing. Um, this is one of them, even though this is outside Ghana. But we've done quite a number of these user engagements uh, in Ghana. <coughs> Um, you know, just one more question, because uh, then I want to uh, bring Rabia in. You, you know, in, in some of these slides, if I could just kind of jump to them, how does this work? Yeah, it just works with one thing. I'm not sure why. Yeah, it doesn't work. Oh, let me try for it. Maybe we have to direct it towards battery. something else. Well, I mean, okay, so, you know, in the, in the slides ahead, we start to get the sense that there's something very powerful happening at the national level. And even though there's a cascade model being approached, um, there is a sense of dilution of purpose and uh, effectiveness as we go further down the tiers. So two questions related to that one. Um, were you able to track kind of the larger local governance uh, environment within which this reform was happening, and was there any significant relationship with your programming? Um, and two, just theoretically, why do you think dilution starts to happen at a sub-national or sub-district level? So let me answer the second part first. So it, it appears well. I mean, it is, because the data, the, the data speak to it. There appeared to have been more seriousness on the part of the reform secretariat in making sure that the national level um, delivery approaches worked well. It started from there. The reform secretariat is only situated at the national level. So the reform secretariat, the mandating agency, doesn't have offices at the sub-national level. So the reform secretariat has no office at the regional, <coughs> at the regional level. They have no office at the district level. They have no offices within the communities where the schools are. So in terms of monitoring, it was stronger at the national level. Uh, in terms of uh, resources, it was better at the national level. Uh, so when the cascading started, there were these um, gaps. Presence and visibility of the mandating agency was way limited at the sub-national level. Resources were limited at a sub-national level. Right. Um, even though the regional directors, district directors, and the um, local government were empowered to play a role, it was, it was limited. It was limited. But we have evidence that the district assemblies continue to support the implementation of these uh, delivery approaches. Um, district officers provide money in some districts for training. Um, some provide money for furniture, some provide money for fuel <coughs> for inspectors to go to, the <coughs> to go to the schools and all that. So to directly answer your question, um, in terms of monitoring, in terms of resources, it was way better at the national level as compared to the local, the district and the ND. And the first part was... The additional local government structures yes. outside of the program, right. which are already part of Ghanaian administration? Yes. So as I indicated, at the district level, we have the, um, a lot of district committees that play the role. So the district chief executive himself or herself heads one committee that meets once every month to make sure that um, things were being done, even though in reality um, meetings were not regular for, again, inadequate resources. In all the districts that we visited, the five districts, none of them had been able to meet every month, as expected. Um, so there were these challenges at the district level, even though the local government, one, was expected to provide furniture. So when it comes to furniture in the schools, it is a responsibility of the local government. 
and many local governments were not meet, meeting the expectation. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's interesting because we saw like this, um, and there's this picture, where to go, sorry. There's somebody delivering a kind of class almost, this one. So there seems to be, and this is at the national level, so there's this use of technology and kind of diagrammatic representation, or like visualizations of data. Uh, was this something that you saw at the subnational and then lower tiers, especially the use of technology? So yes, some of them. But this is the the head of the reform secretariat himself. Himself. himself okay. Yes, and uh, this picture um, was one of the meetings with some stakeholders. Hmm. But if you go to the the district technology um, um, technology use is very limited. Um, so you don't, you wouldn't see much of this in the, in the at the district level. Um, there are many district offices that don't have resources. In fact, one district office that didn't even have a computer. Um, so these were key resources, really, really limited, uh, if you want to compare the national office to the subnational offices. The difference is, is, is glaring. Yeah. You know, I think that's a really good point to bring Rabia in, because I think some of those issues and those tensions, I would say, they, they resonate. I think they can resonate with uh, an audience in Pakistan. Um, Rabia, should I introduce you? Do you need an introduction? Does everyone know who Dr. Rabia Manik is? Uh, she, she is uh, an assistant professor at the School of Education currently on leave. Rabia is also the CEO and uh, a fellow at the Institute for Jesus. Development and Economic Alternatives, more commonly and more easily known as IDEAS in Lahore. Uh, Rabia is currently based in Karachi, but has um, very graciously flown in to Lahore and put up with our horrible air quality uh, for a week to, to spend time with us and to be here at the session today. Um, Rabia's interest uh, kind of, I mean, largely you deal with, uh, hang on, let me turn towards you. No, well, sorry, I was going that way. Yeah, no. Um, right. I mean, a lot of Rabia's interest, I think, is very well captured in this project which is uh, uh, investigating how we can kind of move the needle on systems reform in low income contexts. Uh, Rabia has also been involved in research um, on questions of inclusion, inclusivity in education, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've dabbled with early childhood development, and that's something that you're still, working could, on, yeah, yeah. Uh, still uh, looking to pursue. And I think that you know that that broad variety of research interests is is so helpful when you're doing work that's trying to understand how a system. Uh, at the top level is really thinking about educational problems and uh, not always getting it right. Yes. <laughs> um, and finally, just, you know, shameless plug for Oxonians and people like, what do I call you? Somebody from Cambridge. Yeah, no, I know, but I'm coming to that. What would I call you guys? Oh, I have no idea. I've never asked. Because I know what we call you. What? No. Okay, let's <laughs> <laughs> but Ramya did her PhD from the University of Cambridge. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope to have you back at SOE soon, Ramya. Thank you so much, Sophia. And I'm just really grateful to our colleagues from Ghana and Oxford who've come and given us a chance to all sit together and talk about this. I'm also going to stand up, if I may. Yes, please. Thank you. So you just heard Michael talk about a delivery approach reform that was introduced in Ghana. And this was introduced in 2018 and is ongoing. The delivery approach reform that I'm going to talk to you about today was introduced in Punjab in 2012, and it ended in 2018. So ours is a retrospective study um, of an attempt to improve service delivery via accountability approaches. Um, the study itself. Um, uh, is about the education roadmap in Punjab. Uh, it has two components. So the Khanna study and the Pakistan study is part of a larger cross-country uh, study on how delivery approaches work. Do they improve things? What is it uh, that they change in terms of implementation of large-scale uh, reforms in the government sector? And uh, you may not be able to believe it, but about 40 countries in the world have actually introduced delivery approaches. And there's less than 10 
um, uh, uh, vigorously done studies on what's happened in those 40 countries. Uh, so at the moment, there's these four countries and four cases that we're studying. In the Pakistan case, or the investigation of what happened with the education roadmap um, is in two parts. There's a quantitative component which uses administrative data that is generated by Punjab's education management information system. Um, that's done by colleagues at the World Bank and University of Princeton. I won't be able to talk about that today. Today, we're going to be talking about um, the quant qualitative component. So very similar to uh, the way a mic study was designed uh, in Kana, we've gone and spoken to people who were involved with the design and the implementation of the reform. Um, so as I said, in 2012, Pakistan, uh, Punjab introduced a delivery approach. It was in, not, education wasn't the only sector that this approach was introduced in, but the idea was that through this approach, and I'll talk a little bit about the functions that comprise this approach, um, was to improve social service delivery in the districts. Um, and that's important to remember. And the people who were involved in sort of the designing uh, of this and operationalization of this was the political leadership at the federal level, the political leadership at the time at the provincial level, the bureaucratic leadership, the donors and development consultants as well. So for those of you who are familiar uh, with the WDR framework of 2004 or who are familiar with the education systems approach, there were a number of stakeholders at various hierarchy levels who were involved in the design and the implementation um, of this uh, approach and reform. The people who are executing this at the district level, we know them within Pakistan as DCs, district commissioners, or district coordinating officers. The reason I've put a slash there is around 2016, there was a terminology change. Um, so this is essentially the same people. They're executive administrators at the district level um, that essentially um, implemented the delivery approach that was introduced at the provincial level at the district level. You also had district education departments. Many of you might have heard about uh, DEAs or district education authorities. So essentially what used to be education departments became, became DEAs at some point. The functions broadly remain the same, um, but these are the actors who are important when we're talking about delivery approaches. So the re approach remained active between 2012 and 2018. It was introduced in all 36 districts in Punjab. So this is 150 thousand schools, 350 thousand teachers, the most populous province in Pakistan. I don't, and, and, and this I think links a little bit to what Sufia was saying, we're interested in state sector reform. We're very critical of the state as well and the government as well, but we often forget the scale at which they're functioning. And so if you think about from your own experience running say one school or running one class versus having to run 150 thousand schools, with 350,000 employees, and that's only the teachers. You're not even counting all the other staff that you're talking about, and coordinating, as Michael also said for Ghana, between multiple agencies in order to make delivery happen, right? Uh, so Pakistan's case for the global uh, project focuses on the education sector reform. As I said, ours is a retrospective qualitative study which traces how this reform was enacted, actually. So we've gone and built an understanding of what happened. Um, so the kinds of questions we try to answer is what was the type of the delivery approach? What, what were the goals? What were the priorities set? Um, and by whom, for whom, and why, we're trying to look at the kinds of management practices that changed at the district and provincial level. So you know the bureaucrats that sit within the chief minister's office, that sit within the education department at the provincial level, at the planning and development department, at the finance department, education reform department, they all go about their business in a way doing things that allow various other parts of the machinery to run, right? Whether it's designing budgets, signing budgets, um, figuring out how to get resources down to the school level, et cetera, et cetera. This is all part of the types of things they do in their daily professional lives. With the introduction of that approach, some of those changed. And the whole point of that approach is to actually change some of those practices in order so if we think that things are not working, let's tweak some of these practices and try to improve them. 
Um, we're interested also in seeing, so what were the changes in these practices, but what do the people who participated in this reform have to say? So this is not just about outsiders coming and looking, or not just us talking to um, the people who designed it and implemented it. Uh, we want to talk to the people who participated within this reform to understand, well, what happened? If you were asked to do certain things, what was effective and what was not effective, right? Um, and finally, we're not going to be talking about uh, the types and level of outputs or the political features, um, or political economy aspects uh, of Punjab versus others. What we're going to focus a lot on is this answer to this question, this question, and a little bit uh, about why the approach and by whom um, and what were they thinking. So one of the key features, Michael, I did want to, I did put in the whole matrix. And the reason was that I wanted to point out, uh, this is the conceptual framing that underpinned the cases. So now, you may or may not have read a lot about delivery approaches in Pakistan because it became a controversial topic, right? And it became very closely associated uh, with a couple of names, right? Um, good, the good of it became associated as well as the bad of it. But the whole point of approaching this from an academic perspective is that you leave that subjectivity behind and you quite objectively try to understand what is it that a delivery approach does. So at the top you see about four functions that colleagues of ours who are at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford have spent time, they've spent time mapping the delivery approaches across the globe. And what they've come up with that is common between all these approaches is all delivery approaches try to set priorities and targets. They, tr they monitor through use of data. They set accountability and in investment schemes. Michael spoke about performance contracts. I remember that because it's an interesting point of contrast between Pakistan and Canada, actually. Um, and so they set accountability and incentives. And there's meant to be problem solving. And you're meant to encourage problem solving at the district level. So these four things actually show a little bit about what delivery approaches think is the way to improve service delivery at the lower levels, right? So we've deconstructed those functions into different practices. We won't be talking too much about this, but just to give you a sense that we spoke to them about how this was happening, right? And then um, how the, and what was working and what was not working. So here's a diagram of actually some of the actors that make up the delivery chain, the service delivery chain in the education sector. You've got the CM's office, the chief minister's office, and you can sort of time travel back to 2012 uh, because that's where we are and that's where the study is right now. Uh, you've got the political leadership, you've got the donors, you've got the management consultants, and this is the delivery unit. And as Michael um, and, and Sufia shared, some of the delivery units, the theory, and the, the uh, uh, formation and the idea is coming from the UK, right? Um, and it's being implemented in different contexts. You've got various sub-departments. We're focused on the school education department, where, which the delivery approach also focused on. And then you've got a breakdown of, at the district level, who are the people who take the policies that are being designed and the reform that is being designed down all the way to the school. So when we talk about the delivery approach, it was designed here along with, with the help of these two guys and acted on the district level with the help of grassroots level or frontline bureaucrats, right? And these are the people that we've interviewed. We've interviewed these guys as well to try and understand how the implementation happened. Um, so we've interviewed um, in 12 districts in Punjab with 23 uh, DCs. We made a list of the complete set of DCs in these uh, 12 districts. There were about 45 of them. 23 of them spoke to us, others did not. Um, and what we've asked them about is what their experience was, what they recall uh, the practices were and how they changed, um, what their perceptions are about what the effective practices were and what some of them were not effective about. We've also spoken to about 38 education department representatives in five districts. And again, we've asked them the same question. So as Michael was also explaining, the delivery approach gets introduced at the top hierarchy and it cascades down. In Pakistan's case, it got introduced at the provincial level and it cascaded down to the district level. These guys 
are both at the district level, but they're subordinate to these ones. Um, and these guys were reporting to the chief minister at the provincial level and the secretary at the... So we were interested in tracing the cascade, and the main way we've done that is by asking both of these guys the same kinds of questions. And there's some really interesting findings about when you design a reform sitting in Lahore, the way that it cascades down to, say, Gujranwala, Kasur, um, Rahim Yar Khan, etc., in those offices, how much of it remains the same, how much of it is perceived to be similar and not. So exactly as the, it mirrors the kind of design that you've heard about in Ghana. So as I said, the approach was designed and operationalized in the provincial capital, which meant that a delivery unit was set up. It was housed very closely within the chief minister's office. Let me just stop for one second. Somebody will need to keep time and stop. You're good. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so uh, a delivery unit was set up and it was housed within the... The reason this is significant is one of the things that delivery approaches do is really try to leverage political ownership to make a very ambitious reform happen. So in, in Punjab's case, Shehbaz Sharif's political capital was very, very closely associated with this approach and in introducing it and why the bureaucrats responded to what the reform was saying needed to do. Right? Um, and I'll talk more about this. So the unit closely worked with the education department, the PMIU, um, for those of you who work on education center or are taking courses on education, you know what this is. These are important subunits of the education department. Um, and these are the ones that house all the administrative data. Priorities were identified and targets were set. So Punjab sat down, and in the same way that we have education sector plans, it set for itself the top three goals that it wanted to achieve. Those were the priorities that the, that the people set. Um, and then those priorities were translated into targets, right? Which is to say that if we want greater uh, access to education, that's a priority, we have to get enrollments up. We have to make sure that they're coming every day. So enrollment is a target, student attendance is a target, teacher attendance is a target, right? Um, so uh, and district. So that's that's one thing that's to do with priorities and targets. And then you had a whole list of district executive administrators or the DCs or DCOs who were summoned to Lahore every three months to report on how much progress they had made on each of these indicators. Right. So suddenly, districts that hadn't been in touch with for a long time were now being asked to provide data and explanations for whether or not they had made progress on the targets that were set. So the targets were received by the DCs and the DCOs. Data packs were received by them. Um, so it was a very top-down sort of setup. There were a series of meetings that also began to happen at the district level. So if there are accountability meetings that are happening at the provincial level where the DCs are reporting to the chief minister, and by the way, he attended for six years every single meeting that happened every three months. And he sat there for two to three hours looking at um, paying attention to this, which became the main reason why, and we speak about this a little bit, so Ghana had performance contracts, which was a different way of making sure that um, the, the bureaucrats were realizing what they were signing up to. In this case, the bureaucrats were signing up to something because the chief minister signaled that this is important and you've got to do it, right? Um, and we'll talk about the formality and informality of it. So there were a series of meetings that started at the provincial level, a series of activities that started also at the district level. So you suddenly had, Punjab had always had data. It had always had quite good, robust uh, school administrative data on enrollments, infrastructure, teacher presence, etc. That data had not been used for monitoring and accountability. And suddenly, it was being used for that, right? And it was being used in meetings that were happening in Lahore, as well as meetings that were happening in each of the 36 districts. Um, there were also incentives, which is to say the well-performing districts DCOs were rewarded, and the poor-performing districts were sanctioned, basically, right? Um, so the delivery approach was leveraged to um, uh, it leveraged the authority of the pro provincial political leadership. Um, and one of the things was that this was imagined as a political oversight model. But the political oversight model here, for those of you who are studying development studies, was not one where it's grassroots politics that holds local bureaucrats 
uh, or local politicians accountable. This political uh, oversight model was very top down. There's one man sitting in Lahore, he's interested in making this happen. He can either have you moved from this district if you don't respond, or he can reward you if you do a good job, right? So it's a very top down uh, political oversight model. And uh, at the core of it is exactly as was the vocabulary, I think that was also being used in other countries, is to say that the system itself is fine, but it's not efficient. So by introducing certain kinds of practices like target setting, like accountability, like monitoring, you can introduce greater efficiency within the system. And the second thing was the data regime, right? So a lot of data was now flowing upwards from the school to the provincial level, being processed and being sent down so that actions could be taken um, on it. So the priorities were broad and process oriented, but the targets were more specific and the reform was intended to be top down, right? And it was also intended to achieve results very, very fast. Um, so how did the int introduction of this uh, approach change management practices? As I said, Punjab always had a history of target setting. If you pick up the education sector plans, if you pick up the policies that are written at the provincial levels, Hamisha Osma targets mention, they're always mentioned. But what what the delivery approach did is instead of a, an education sector plan is for five years and you come back to it at the end of five years, right? What these guys were doing was looking at targets every three months. And at the district level, they were looking at it even more frequently, right? So all of a sudden, the intensity and frequency of data uh, being viewed uh, in terms of what needed to be achieved was much higher suddenly between 2012 and 2018. They made the review of targets a routine practice. They broke the targets down by districts, and they made one person at the district level accountable for everything that was happening, right? If you saw progress, you answer. If you don't see progress, you answer, which is the DC or the DCO, right? So the first generation of targets focused on enrollments and infrastructure. A lot of people talk about low-hanging fruit, and they, so they wanted to show quick progress. They focused on some of these. The second generation of targets introduced for, uh, then began to sort of focus on some process level indicators like teacher attendance and student attendance. So again, as I said, target setting was very top down. Um, the targets cascaded down from the district to the sub-district level. But one of the things we find, and here's some quotes that you can see, is setting a target, but which, whether it's about enrollment, whether it's about teacher attendance, that compares urban Lahore to rural Rahim Yar Khan forces a simplification of a very complex context, right? Even simply distances are too long, right? So, and, and the DC speak to us about that because suddenly they were being held accountable and they had to speak about why they couldn't get the teachers to go to school to teach, but the DC for Lahore or urban Lahore with its transport infrastructure is being made to be accountable to the same targets that somebody living in Rahim Yar Khan is being asked to be made accountable to, right? And the targets also overlooked system level complexity. So while they were being held accountable for student attendance, more than 50% of the schools were single teacher schools. Now the DC doesn't have the authority to put teachers in, in schools or to hire more teachers, and neither do they have resources. But they're supposed to answer if one of the teachers takes a medical leave that day and the school is closed, right? And that gets flagged. The way the accountability mechanisms were working were through three things. So compared to performance contracts, the chief ministers chairing the meeting was something that these people responded to. That mattered. They needed to sort of keep him. Um, then there was a competition between peers, and there were good performances um, uh, and bad performances. So here's a quote that says, uh, that sort of uh, talks about what they thought about the chief minister. So I wouldn't say it was fear necessarily, but the point is that the quarterly rankings and performance caused a lot of concern. Education is a passion, and everyone takes it very differently, but usually every DC used to be on their toes, because when those top three and last three districts were interrogated, there used to be performance accountability, right? Um, and Shahbaz Sharif would ask questions like, what's wrong with you, DC Miawali? The indicator is very low. So he's like, I can take, I can take my name here, uh, because he himself was DC Miawali, 
But the point is that the chief minister was questioning them on a very personal level, and that was the main mechanism through which accountability uh, was being driven. Shefa Sharif used to ask very difficult questions about why there wasn't any improvements, right? The peer pressure. We do not want to be punished in front of our colleagues, right? We don't take criticism as criticism, we take it as punishment. So in, as opposed to a formal performance contract that you're being judged by, in uh, Punjab at least, you had these very informal mechanisms through which accountability was functioning. But what's even more interesting is this is the DCs you're talking about. When you look at the education department, uh, one of the things that you see uh, is that the people who were helping the DCs achieve the targets did not receive bonuses. And they were also not punished, but here's what they say about, um, here's what they say, oh, I think maybe I haven't put them in the But there was a culture of fear that developed at the education department. So one level, two levels below the DCs, the DCs thought it was quite great that, you know, they were competing with one another, it was quite good, okay, great. Um, it was quite good and fun in some ways, um, but, uh, but also kept them on their toes. But everybody below that suddenly had to go to meetings, suddenly had to start reporting a lot more, and they were quite fearful because they didn't fully understand why they were being asked to do this, right? Um, the other thing was, which I wanted to point out, and here's the point of contrast, that what the DCs were formally judged for never changed. Their annual confidential reports, which is their end of year uh, contract, performance evaluation, it never changed. So they knew that this project uh, is separate from something that they're part of. So it's, it's temporary, they knew that. Um, oh, here's where the fear comes in. Uh, so as I said before, there was a real sense of fear and foreboding due to these meetings, and this is a DDEO, so he's much below the DCs, right? Let me skip some of this. But just to say that many meetings start, so there was a lot of activity both at the provincial level as well as at the district level in response to this reform that was introduced. Um, but whether or not it really changed anything in a sustainable way remains a question. So Punjab introduced this top-down data-driven accountability regime and it, was, it moved forward because of a lot of political uh, ownership. But, and the management at the district level did change, right? Management practices did respond. And there was considerable, if not complete, compliance. So whatever the districts were being asked to do, they did, right? However, many of the practices did not sustain once the reform was over. So it was completely, so all these meetings now don't happen. Data is no longer being used in the same way that it was used between 2012 and 2018. So we find that bureaucrats do respond to immediate asks. If you really want to get the bureaucracy moving, you can get them to do it by a very heavily sort of push, a reform that you push through the system. But in the long run, the bureaucrats will only respond to invest incentives and norms of work that are long established and not necessarily pro project linked. And this has implications for what you're trying to improve. So again, if you're, if you're being quite strict with someone for building a wall or for building a school, that's something you can observe. That's more input level um, uh, indicators. When it comes to something like learning or the teaching process, which is difficult to observe and quite difficult to even quantify, then you might run into problems with an approach which is very top down. And this kind of sort of, uh, the study as well as actually the studies I think in, in all of our projects perhaps contribute to the kind of literature which is questioning what the best way is for bringing about improvements in service delivery at the district level. I'll stop. Really great stuff. Um, I'm just wondering whether Mike, did you want to come up here so we could all be sitting together? Sure. Uh, just move. It doesn't. Yeah. I'm just uh, sorry. I'm gonna keep myself angled. Fine. Like this, cause you can see the screen. No, cause I can see you guys. Oh. Cause my neck is hurting now. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Rebia, why don't we start just a little bit with a bit of commentary on your piece. First of all, thank you so much. This is quite comprehensive. And you know, I mean, just to the audience, wasn't it exciting to see like research about the context in which you're living your lives? And uh, you know, I hope that uh, that that's uh, kind of helping you see or gain a little bit more perspective about what it really means to be an education researcher or a researcher in the space, right? Because now you can speak with a little bit more confidence about, OK, I think this can work. This is definitely not going to work. And that last paragraph is so important, right, about like what does sustainability look like in public service delivery? Um, so let's actually kick off from that question of sustainability, because I love the fact that we've We've got this comparison going on of time periods. Uh, Ghana is still in process, has probably benefited from uh, you know, whatever feedback has been coming from other country contexts. And uh, Punjab's already not just gone through it, but with commitment shelved it. <laughs> so uh, you know, this would be, I, I, I want to see whether as two different academics looking at a similar process in different contexts, what do you think? Um, it can be something that Ghana, let's start with Mike. What do you think you guys want to take um, from the Pakistan context and uh, not get wrong uh, for Ghana, especially as you, Peter, off because you mentioned you end um, nurse in March 23, right? Um, so does, does this bring thoughts to mind? It, it does. Um, so one, we both talked about the issue of sustainability. Uh, which, which is important. Um, we both also talked about the fact that it appeared to be more rigorous and probably more effective at the national level. So what is it that is not being done at the district level to achieve similar level of effectiveness that we see at the national level? Um, for the Pakistan case, I'm curious about the sanctions for non-performing districts. And want to find out, so two comments and a question. Want to find out if there is evidence that post-sanction error led to some, mm. some level of achievement. So my question is, are these sanctions bringing positive results? Because, I mean, I want to believe that the expectation is for these sanctions to wake people up so the system gets better. Did we find that? But I see a lot of similarities, uh, especially the issue of sustainability. I think it's an area that we can both discuss and see. Because we are concerned, as we went to the field, we were concerned about the sustainability. And post-March, I'm not sure what is going to happen you know, with, this, with this approach, whether it's going to continue or we are going to let it go. You know, can I just come back? Um, okay. Um, I just want to come back in and, I, you know, it's a little bit of food for thought. Um, so SMU wasn't always driving um, the roadmap. It was, uh, it, it, was, it was set up halfway through with the deliberate intention of being that space in the government which would receive what otherwise a team of consultants, the roadmap team, was constantly providing support to the CM office for. But that transition never happened, uh, and you know, for a variety of reasons. And I wonder whether in your model, in the Ghanaian model, are you guys seeing um, a better chance at institutionalization? Because you're saying that nurse is going to wrap up, but the secretariat seems to have been embedded within uh, the ministry to begin with, as opposed to somewhere outside? So Ghana has an existing unit that should be playing, or that plays the evaluation of these management practices. I mean, so we have the um, budget PBME um, procurement so there is a unit in charge of monitoring management practices. Now, when the delivery approach and the reform secretary was established in 2017, <clears throat> this unit was upset. <clears throat> they were upset because their point was that if you resource 
the existing unit, the evaluation unit, we should be able to do the work that the reform secretary is coming to do. But over the years, they have not performed well. They have budgetary allocation, but they have not performed well. So reform secretariat was established. Now from day one, they saw, they saw reform secretariat as a new unit that is being supported by the minister to do their work. So the relationship wasn't good. They laid back and reform secretary has been doing the thing. The expectation was for them to learn from reform secretariat so that when the contract ends, they can take over. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen, and that is why we are still not sure who is going to play the role of the reform secretariat after March. But the reality is that there is, there is, there is a unit that should be doing this. It hasn't been effective. Um, resource may be one of the problems, staffing the right people with the, with the right uh, training and competence to be able to play that role. The other argument is that why is it that reform secretariat is not being intentionally transformed into that particular unit? That is also not happening because reform secretary staff are saying we won't go there. Because when we go there, we become government um, employees. Our, our incentives would not be as we are having now because it's a contract kind of thing. So um, in our case, there was, there was an existing unit that didn't get a chance to play that role. And now they see themselves as, um, um, they see themselves as competitors instead of working together to make it happen. I don't know whether that answers your question. So if may I come in? So actually, I think that's a really important point because both, so in terms of sustainability, both the, what Mike asked in terms of, uh, or maybe it was Sufi's question, about why is it that the cascade always falters, right? So, so you've got a lot of motivation, a lot of information flows, a, a, you, uniform understanding, but the moment it sort of cascades, um, it, it begins to scatter and it begins to break up. And also other, even at the same level, other uh, subunits that may not be part of the core of the reform don't have that information and begin to scatter or tensions develop. And I think it's because the delivery units and the design of this reform is thinking perhaps too narrow. It's not thinking about the whole delivery chain. I don't think they're thinking about the bureaucrats who actually have to implement the reform and how they might receive it. Because you don't see it in any of the discourse that either gets written about delivery units. So what they talk about is data for monitoring, which is a positive practice. They talk about incentives and sanctions, and I'll just come to Mike's question. And they talk about very fast-paced reform and efficiency changes. They're not talking about taking everybody along for the ride, which I think is the biggest, probably, uh, factor. If you want to sustain reform through the system, you probably will be gone before those guys. Those are around for a long time, right? At the, at the, so to think about and take them along right from the start of the design of the reform is a very important feature that I think needs to be updated in the design of delivery approaches. Um, but the other, and conversations across different units as well. You may not be able to generate ownership across, but you have to try. It, currently, that conversation isn't happening. Um, in terms of sanctions, Mike, so this was really interesting. What we heard was that people used to get transferred to really undesirable posts if, if your district was not performing well. So if your district was in the rankings that these consultants put together, if you were in the bottom three, you weren't the DC of, say, Multan anymore. You were the DC of yeah, Rajanpur, Rajan <laughs> right, the next day. And you were packing your bags and going. And we've been trying to find people who were transferred, and we can't. Um, so we haven't, we haven't got first-hand accounts of, of those uh, guys. But, but um, they did say to us, so the sanctions were informal because people have said to us that we knew uh, that there wasn't, so, so they were motivated to perform, but they weren't afraid that their career would be damaged, right? So in some ways, and this links with sustainability, I thought one feature that Ghana has introduced in terms of performance contracts, which is not your employment contract, 
is how I understood in conversations with, so your employment contract is what you sign with the government the day you become a bureaucrat. But you can sign additional contracts, which is to say I'm committing to the achievements of these. And we've never asked our DCs or EDOs to ever sign an additional contract. They only have the employment contracts. They don't have anything else. And it's all sort of informal mechanisms of being afraid of you know, the hierarchy that gets them to respond. So I think some features, you're, I completely agree, have been built into the Ghana system, which I think might make it more sustainable. I'll stop. You know, um, I want to, I'm like speaking into the antenna. Um, and it, it, this question, I mean, I, I have two separate questions. One is about the performance contracts, and I want to come back to it. It's a legal question. But just returning to what we were discussing about, you know, sustainability and the norms, and I wonder how important in both of your respective and considered opinions, the norms around bureaucratic practice um, are built into uh, the design of the mechanism. Rabia, you've touched upon it by saying that it, the one norm that was not considered was of collectivism. That together, this is our system, we are responsible for fixing it um, and nudging it in that direction. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so there was a lot of informality in the Punjab context. Um, what is the power of informal influence um, to change systems? in sustainable ways, and how can we then think about building it into uh, structures um, almost, I mean, after the fact, right? Yeah, so in my presentation, uh, you remember I talked about delivery approach, the Ghanaian way. Yeah. Right, so we recognize that Ghana has some cultural wealth that we can throw away. So for instance, in the community where there is a school, the expectation is that the school belongs to the community. Right. And the community recognizes that the school belongs to them. So the traditional rulers in those communities, the chief, as we call them, knows that this school belongs to my community and I. The district assembly has also been mandated to take over some responsibility of the school. <laughs> Now, within these communities, we have assembly men who are members of the local government of the area. So the assembly men, the traditional rulers, parents, imams, and pastors, they all know they have a role to play in the management of the school. And this is informal. Now, government has intentionally given all these uh, groups seats on the school management committee. So the traditional ruler is represented on the school management committee. The religious leaders are represented on the school management committee. Parents are there, teachers are there. So they form the highest decision-making body of the local school. So there is that local ownership of the school that is interested in the success story of their own school. So even though these are public schools, there's an intentional plan to provide local ownership. So they play a role. So in all these discussions, there are annual meetings where all these representatives are there for the school head to make a report. But the reality is that on the field, we realize that these monthly meetings don't happen every month. But the, that sense of ownership is within the communities, and they are proud of it, that my school must grow and develop and become better because children in my communities have just this school. So that is, that is a reality, and, and, and they have embraced it. So to some extent, that helps with issues of sustainability. To the extent that sometimes the community members will question a school leader, a school head, who doesn't stay in the school. Sometimes a chief will summon you to his palace to come and explain why you have not been in school for the past one week. And they do this in a very nice way, such that there are no threats. It is just a reminder of your, your responsibility as a member of the community. So these things are there, and um, I believe they, they help in some of these things. And uh, Rabia, uh, I would love to hear whether you guys um, saw the SMC featuring in any of those responses. And relatedly, just to tag on to what uh, Mike was mentioning about 
um, this school is the only option that my community has got. I wonder whether the state, in its lack of provision historically, um, I'm talking about the Punjab context, uh, uh, allowed private schools to emerge and have they contributed eventually to a crowding out of public schooling yeah. to an extent where parents are saying, well, okay, if you're not going to you help my kid, then I'm just going to move them to a private school, a low-cost private school. Did you see any of those narratives? We did not. I don't think, I think we didn't, so not in this study, we didn't. But one of the things we did see was the SMC and the way that that's been designed in Punjab, which is to say that at the school level as a vehicle for uh, support and empowerment of the school head and as a way to cut through uh, the bureaucratic red tape. Um, whether or not it's actually functioning that way is a different question, but one of the things we did see is the few examples of problem solving. So there wasn't an explicit focus in the design of the delivery approach in Punjab to encourage problem solving. I think the entire focus was on accountability and monitoring, right? And somehow something was supposed to change. But in response to that, problem solving did happen in pockets where the DCs and the education department team was really working together well. Um, uh, in the problem solving, uh, in those problem solving examples, the DCs turned to the schools to leverage the resources that were available to them to solve local problems. So you did see these partnerships develop for the sake of the government school. Um, and one of the things that got introduced, I think, at the same time was in order to fix the resource availability problem, the government introduced, and some of this, I think, was in response to the kinds of conversations that were happening at the stock take. So when you hold DCs accountable, they're, and in their explanations for why they aren't able to achieve certain indicators, structural problems of districts emerged. So this problem that we don't have enough money when we need it emerged. Right? And so one reform that got introduced between 2012 and 2018 was the non-salary budget formula, where money goes directly from the province to the school, uh, bypassing all the red tape in the middle, which the DCs could work with the head teachers to leverage, or the EDOs could to, to solve problems. So we saw that happening, but we didn't, uh, and, and, and there's a role for the SMC, because the SMC is supposed to sign off on, on, on expenditures that get done at the school level. But I'm afraid we weren't talking to the parents and teachers. Okay. But the exit has definitely happened. The exit from the private public and, and Just going back to the contracts. Yes. You know, um, in the Punjab context, were you guys able to find any legal reasons why a second contract couldn't be offered or signed? No. No? No. I think there just wasn't. Uh, it just wasn't part of the conversation. What I'm understanding, and Mike, please correct me, is that performance contracts are not that unusual in Ghana. Like, this wasn't the first reform that introduced a performance contracts. Like, that's something that's usual. That's and it, I've actually never heard of a performance contract being introduced for anybody. You have ACRs, which is your annual, which all government standard. officials, which is standard, um, and which is all government officials, which was introduced somewhere I don't even know when, like much long ago. It hasn't been updated to respond to the current uh, uh, sort of policy or delivery situation. But I've never heard about a performance contract in the context of Pakistan. So that for us is, a, is actually an emerging finding in true collaboration. So when we heard about the Ghana presentation, when all the country cases came together, it really, I had to ask, I was like, do you mean the employment contract? And they said, no, this is different. So, uh, so I wasn't even aware that it, there was such a thing that you could legally, so you could, it's legal accountability. Yeah. Yes, it's legal accountability rather than ad hoc informal accountability. Um, so, <clears throat> shall, we, shall we open? Yes. <clears throat> How do we pass the mic around? That, oh, oh, I can do it. Okay. Oh, they mics have mics. Me. They all have mics. So we can keep right, if I had been facing the audience, I would have noticed. That. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, over to you. So who wants, so who's got a question? Go ahead. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is Yahaya. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rabia, Dr. Um, Michael. Thank you, Michael, thank you, Steen, for coming here today. It was a great session. Um, I have questions for the Pakistani context. So, Dr. Rabia, um, 
I think the first one was a thought that, that was on my mind, but you also kind of touched upon it, that um, different parts of Punjab are facing different struggles, which means that some areas might require more support. And so there's a lot of talk about accountability, accountability, but there's very little talk about what support is coming from the top level yeah. Yeah. Um, for these people. You know, I was, I was actually thinking about Lahore and how uh, during um, the smog, the schools were getting affected. Yes. But in um, the south part of the province, that was not so much of a concern. So obviously that was impacting the way that our systems, like in Lahore, the systems were being run. So what kind of support is being provided there? And I think my second question would be, um, given that there's so much political instability, we talk about sustainability, we talk about how like these bureaucrats can can continue these um, practices long term, but then when the top, you know, um, leadership changes, it kind of just everything happens from the start because then the new leadership kind of has their own vision and wants to do things their own way. So then, how can we expect them to kind of, um, you know, carry that vision and that passion uh, across? Thank you so much. So both of those are really important uh, questions, and thanks for bringing it up because it gives me a chance to talk. So there's two kinds of ways that we found that support was given. So even though broadly targets were the same and comparison was happening uh, across the same levels, we did hear from the DCs that they did ask us. Um, so, so the the improvement was also relative. So, if you if you as a district were at a r lower level, you were made to see what you changed in three months. Uh, but eventually, there was pressure that you've got to catch up. You've got to catch up with everybody else. Uh, we have also heard that extra resources were provided to special interest districts in uh, South Punjab. And this point that I made that when the, when the DC started articulating the problems of some of the lesser developed districts, attention was paid. Um, the third or fourth kind of support that was provided was, and I guess this is the top political oversight model, is in, unfortunately for Pakistan, local politics sometimes is not a positive partnership for bureaucracy. Sometimes there's interference in a, in a disruptive, negatively disruptive way. So which is to say that uh, teacher appointments is also political patronage. In a, a government teacher appointments is also a way of doling out political patronage in Punjab. And what we heard very clearly was, apart from, apart from the chief minister giving a very clear signal of his time and commitment and attention, he would say to the district uh, commissioners, you go and do what you need to do. I will create the space for you. So nobody will, if somebody comes and bothers you about where teachers need to be allocated, you let me know. Now he's able to do that because he's got the political capital to do it, but that doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. Which brings me to your second question about with all of these variations uh, in not just the type of political or, or the strength of political capital you have, um, how do you introduce practices that can sort of survive whatever is happening politically, whatever is happening otherwise? And I, I actually think that genuinely the design is also not thinking of it because the, the, none of the district commissioners, regardless of where, wherever they were posted now, were employing practices they did employ when they were part of it, even though they said, no, this was a good practice. We liked being able to see the schools where we needed to, but why aren't you doing it anymore, you know? So, so there needs to be some sort of sensitization about, like they need to be the focus of, um, and they need to participate in the design and the implementation of the reform from the beginning. So, and as a team in Oxford, we've been having a lot of conversations around, well, so we kept saying, particularly the Pakistan case, kept saying, well, the delivery unit, none of the practices are active anymore. And one of our team members turned around and said, well, they're not supposed to be. You have education ministries. They're supposed to be doing this. The same point that you made. You already have peoples and units and departments that are supposed to be doing these functions. We've just transposed something for a while to kickstart it, but you're supposed to adopt and adapt all of these functions because a unit can't be forever. A unit has been introduced to fix a problem and it should disappear so that now the practices that have been introduced gets adapted and sustained by the ministry that was originally set up in 1947 to do the service delivery, right? Otherwise, 
you'd have like units upon units upon units upon units, right? So you're not which we do, which we do. <laughs> and I think also, yeah. So so it's it's not, so so they're supposed to signal and kickstart certain things, but I think so I think both things need to change. I think the way the bureaucracy is receiving um, these external uh, units need to be thought about and designed more carefully and the interactions between the units and the bureaucracies because we also had fights. We had senior bu bureaucrats sort of saying, you know, these kids show up in suits and they're trying to tell us what to do, right? And uh, so who are you, like, you know, trying to tell me which target to achieve? But um, so, so the interaction between the reform that you introduce and the people who are in place to implement it needs to really be at the center of the conversation of the design when you're introducing it. Um, uh, yes, I'll stop here. Yeah. Um, uh, Mike, did you want to add? Yeah. Oh, so two, two things. Um, one, delivery approach, for instance, let me use this one as an example. In, in Ghana's case, it was a five-year funded project. From day one, we should know that at the end of the fifth year, when the funding will expire, there will be no money, no additional money. And by the end of the fifth year, the expectation is that the basis would have been laid for us to continue. And that is why in our case, it is sad that the evaluation unit did not work collaboratively with the reform secretariat. So because of that, they didn't learn from them to be able to continue. So there's a sustainability problem there. But what we also do at the national level is that when there are these interventions, the existing government will take it to parliament for parliamentary approval. So when that is done, a change in government may not necessarily end that particular intervention unless the new president or the new mm -hmm. government goes back to parliament to reverse it. And the new president will need some number of parliamentary, some percentage of parliamentary um, majority to be able to change it. So it will not be as easy as a presidential pronouncement. From tomorrow, we are no longer doing this. It will take steps to go to parliament to have it reserved. So most, not most, all these initiatives will go to parliament for parliamentary approval. It becomes legally binding for successive governments to continue. And if you don't want to continue, you go to parliament and lobby yeah. and get your parliamentarians to reverse it. And it's not, it's not, it's not that easy. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Does have one? Hello. Um, so, I'm sorry, it's just my throat. Um, so, um, since I've been uh, associated, closely associated with the Pakistan study, um, I'm working with Dr. Avia. Um, what I was curious about was that um, you spoke about how there's uh, this local ownership of schools that is present. Uh, and on the other hand, you also, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I heard you mention that the monitors that have been coming in and giving feedback to the teachers, um, uh, they've sort of... Uh, and helped eradicate that suspicion that was initially there. Um, so Mike, um, what I'm curious about over here basically is, um, how did the teachers, especially when they have like such strong local ownership of the school, how did they take that feedback in, in positive lighting? Because there's two ways to go on about that. If you have such strong ownership of the school, um, you don't really take feedback from other people coming in. So uh, that's my question. That's something that I was curious about. Right. So both of them work together. The local ownership is formal. It is formal because they are part of the school management committee. And the school management committee is the highest decision making body of the, of the school. Now the inspectors will come and whatever they do, I mean, there will be a report to the school management committee. Now the school management committee knows that this is a government school and we have been appointed as community members to support and collaborate and partner so that learning outcomes will be achieved. So they don't see themselves as competitors. They see themselves as collaborators working together. So when the inspectors come, sometimes when the inspectors even get to the communities, before they go to the schools, 
they will go and let the community members know they are in town and they are going to be in a school. So there is that close collaboration and partnership and relationships amongst them. So it doesn't become a problem at all. When they come, the teachers know that these are inspectors from the Ghana Education Service and they are here to provide feedback. And the community leaders have no problem with that at all because they, as members of the community and members of the school management committee, they know they don't have the expertise to provide that feedback. And, and they understand that. So the lines are drawn very clearly, and there is no conflict at all in such situations. Um, so just a quick question. Um, one of the criticisms of the de delivery approach that we've heard is that they have very scripted accountability metrics, right? Which can sometimes be constraining. So that's something that I heard echoed in Rubia's presentation. But Mike, I think from your experience, it sounded a lot more positive and it sounded like it was taken a lot more positively. So I'm curious to know more about whether the people you spoke to had talked about feeling constrained. If not, what is different in the Ghanaian context that, that leads to this different outcome? So in the Ghanaian situation, it has moved from accountability constraints to acceptance of the accountability measures. So from the beginning, there was suspicion. People didn't understand the real motive and intent of what government was doing. Uh, people assumed that this might be a witch hunting activity. But when they realized that they are seeing positive changes, with these accountability, target setting, prioritization, um, and all that, they were seeing real positive changes. They realized that, oh, the intent is not negative. After all, the whole idea is to monitor, provide feedback for performance to get better. And once there was that acceptance, it has never been a problem. At the beginning, especially at the, at the national level, it was tough. There was some level of resistance because of the assumptions. But when the data was clear that, oh, we are seeing results, acceptance was, was automatic. So um, it was an initial, an initial concern. A year and a half or so into the program, it really got better. They accepted it. And even people began to self-account, self-accountability setting. Uh, people will avail themselves to go through the process, and uh, so far it's been it's been it's been good. So what was really interesting was actually that some of the more reflective DCs who were quite who were quite engaged with some of our questions, there were very few, but there were some, um, who were very happy to be talking about this reform experience. Um, actually said that look, target setting was a good thing because it at least gave us some visibility. It, what we want to talk to you about is that it was very constraining sometimes. But if, if we had stayed in place, because the tenure of the DC also did not change. So they were being, so in addition to no performance contracts in Punjab, the DCs would only be in place for two years. And then they had to move on to the next district. But they've spent two years trying to bring about a lot of improvements, but now it's time for them to change. So you have to think about all of these tensions with the structure of the bureaucracy if you do want to develop some ownership. And they said to us that, look, we can't tell you, like for building walls, this was great. For, uh, for making sure that electricity and toilets, et cetera, because it's quick to do. But we are not sure if this approach would have allowed us to bring about improvements in things like learning, because that's just too complex. Right? Too many factors going into ensuring that you can ensure that teaching is happening and that's hard enough without killing the motivation of the teacher, right? Um, but, uh, but we're not sure. But the reform didn't stay in place long enough for some of those more nuanced or, or mechanisms for more nuanced outcome indicators to be incorporated as targets. I'll stop. <laughs> We want to give context to when LDs actually started. So I believe the LD started, and Sufia, please correct me, was 2016. Yeah. And so LDs and was, was learning and numeracy. So Punjab had a lot of data, it had a lot of administrative data. Caveat, it did not have any learning data. Mm -hmm. 
So you, be, so you had the metric exam and the fifth grade exam, but they were so focused on the syllabus that it, they weren't, one, they weren't comparable, two, they weren't able to talk about foundational literacy and numeracy skills that all children should have. And so there was an attempt in a very large system to try and introduce the generation of learning data, which was a bit of an experiment. Uh, it, it, it wasn't, there wasn't enough time. They had only two years before the project ended. Um, so, so, and all the stakeholders weren't cooperating. Um, so it, 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 it was an exercise in futility. I think now Punjab has better data on, I don't know about learning, but it has better data on the teaching process. Yeah. Uh, which is to say there's classroom observations happening in all government classrooms on a regular basis, and this has been happening now for at least two to three years. So you have data now on the teaching and learning process, like what's going on inside of classrooms. Um, and again, it, there may be constraints to it because you know you can't do everything at that scale, but it's a very positive next step. But if you were to start using whether a teacher is using questions or not as a target and then holding the VC accountable, or whether the teacher is asking enough questions or not, you can begin to see there are problems, right? Like you have have to devolve. Um, you have to devolve and encourage problem solving at the local level, which, by the way, is what the Pakistan Quant team is trying to say. The Pakistan Quant team is trying to say, think about. You have many agents. You've tried to act on many agents through incentives and accountability. Have you thought about the school leader, and have you thought about them as a positive agent, not about? this person is doing the wrong thing, and we need to go fix them. Yeah. Have you thought about them as a positive agent of change? Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, guys, is there any like final burning questions that you absolutely must pose? Otherwise, should we wrap up? We've had you here for about two hours. So thank you very much uh, you. for turning up, for sticking around, uh, for kind of battling through some very, very complex and difficult ideas about uh, what can improve service delivery uh, in the education sector. I think uh, just three big takeaways that I've kind of put down from this very uh, lengthy and wonderful, for me at least wonderful, uh, conversation was I think number one, uh, at the stage that a program is being designed, there should be an effort to simultaneously not just design the intervention, but also design the backup. Uh, so that it's ready, the capacity is ready at time of transition uh, to switch over. Uh, so think more along the lines, I think, of how tech people are probably spending their time thinking about when a system crashes. Uh, number two, I think I love this idea, and I think we've got an example from KP. Uh, they recently codified the health card um, because they didn't want anyone to come in and take away uh, the extended services that had <clears throat> been introduced, so they legislated on it. And I think that's a great example of how you really protect good social policy. Uh, you put it into a legislative space uh, because then the people's representation is put under pressure, and that's also one way that you can push community voices uh, into the space of advocating for better policy or holding on to good initiatives, even if the system is ready to disregard it. So through the provincial assembly mm -hmm. and through parliament. Probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, whatever level of legislator, uh, legislature applies. Um, and then finally, I think it's really interesting, these you know, actively carving out avenues for collaboration at multiple levels. So I'm hearing collaboration between the old and the new, and that could happen within the same department. But I'm also hearing avenues for collaboration between the department themselves, departments, so the government spaces, and any delivery units, which often exist almost like in a market space, so collaboration between them to get the sense of ownership. I remember McKinsey was actually running the roadmap here. At the time that I joined SMU, McKinsey was kind of petering out, and we had like these champions for McKinsey sitting inside SMU. Why? Because they had been spending so much time with them uh, working on the roadmap. The transition didn't really happen. That's a separate story. Uh, but I've seen firsthand that potential that if you collaborate, you can embed champions within the system uh, for getting things done in a different way. I think the problem probably with the SMU case was that the, the champions were not bureaucrats. Mm. They were also people from the market. Mm. And they were sitting in a government body. And they were also going to go eventually. 
um, and final avenue for collaboration just between community and state. And I think that's an obvious one, just if you want anything in the policy space to sustain, you need to build buy-in, not just at the political kind of top levels, but at multiple levels all the way down to the people uh, or the end users. Because if they benefit, uh, then there's no better advocate uh, for that process to continue. Um, so those are my takeaways, guys. Does that sound clear? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for taking out the time, for coming, for doing this research. I mean, I think that's what I want to thank you most for, for really pushing through that difficult space of talking to people in government all the time. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Thank, uh, you, everyone. thank you, everyone. So, Sophia, no, 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 just for you. Sorry? So you know what she was saying about, um, so what you were saying about conversations between community. So the other factor which like is a whole topic in itself is low trust environments. Yeah. I feel like Ghana is a high trust environment yeah. compared yes. to Pakistan yeah. which is a low trust That's environment. Why I was so curious, like, how did the... Because, because the communities are talking like to the state. Right? We don't trust the state, we yeah. don't trust our teachers, yeah. we don't trust each other. Yeah. And they seem to be having very no. civil conversations. Yeah. 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 They've got like these, all these channels that are sorted yeah. out. Yeah. 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 I wanted to just... A whole different, which by the way, they want to reproduce the more sweet and if you want to. Like it won't have a lot of sweet. Yeah, but.